You are listening to part one of three of our continuing conversation with Alan Green. Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Alan Abadessa Green. Sabelle and Chipper will be joining our conversation. Alan is an author, researcher, and editor of Sync Book 1, Myths, Magic, Media, and Mindscapes, and Sync Book 2, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. Both books explore synchronicity and synchromysticism through the writings of authors within the Sync community. Alan is well-versed in contemporary myths, memes, and synchronicities, revealing amazing insight into ourselves, our culture, and our world. ThinkBook Radio features two weekly podcasts, 42 minutes, and always record with an archive of conversations and interviews with some of the most intriguing minds. Additionally, Alan is the author of a blog titled, Look at All the Happy Creatures, in his soon-to-be-released book, Suicide Kings. Hello, Alan. Welcome back to Sky Blue Symposia. Hello, thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate it. Glad to have you join us again. And we left off last time um, with the topic of archetypes and myths. And I had a question for you about repeating archetypes and what is the relevance and meaning to you? I think it would depend on the archetype, right? Um, so what one of the things that uh, I realized and that this is something that I actually had to realize after a few years of doing synchromysticism was that the, even the, if, if it's, if you're tracking someone else's quote unquote, someone else's synchronicity, if you're tracking memes in pop culture or you're tracking memes in the, uh, you know, public events, the way I, a lot of times I'd focus on politics or things in the news, even still the, archetypes that attract you and that you associate with have a personal resonance. There's a reason why I'm drawn to the stories of Osiris. This is you know, why I focus on things like the king kill, right? This is, um, I'm seeing this archetype playing out again and again and again, and that has a personal meaning to me. And it was only after studying it for a good year, year or so, and I'm like, why am I keep finding the same archetype playing out? And then it's like, sort of smack yourself in the forehead and go, oh, of course, it's because it's me. I'm, to a certain extent, I'm projecting that or I'm viewing it through my lens. Um, this was something, there's a gentleman, Christopher Hunter Myers, who, uh, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to. He, um, I, I had done this big write-up around the time that the Osama bin Laden uh, royal wedding that whole weekend, that crazy weekend, and I did this huge write-up and two parts on my blog, and uh, just sort of kept coming back to it, really just trying to say how important this was. And he just wrote to me and said, "Well, hey, that's interesting and all, but you know, what does this mean to your life? It's something where it's probably not as interesting to write about or to talk about." Um, a lot of times personal synchronicities aren't really that interesting. If I sat here and I told you, oh, I was at the supermarket and then I saw it. It's like, okay, that's that's fine. Um, but it's not really very very interesting or it might be something that's hard to relate why it's so important. You have to lay out context after context after context. Well, I used to be in the sixth grade. I had a school teacher with that name or whatever, whatever it might be. So... Um, I, of course, focus on things that we can all speak to, whether that be pop culture, movies, uh, media, events in the news, things like that. But even then, it's like I said, it's what archetype that you're drawn to, the archetype that you're noticing, it is an expression of your interior state. Synchronicity, we can think of this as somewhat, almost like a hermetic science, right? It's this uh, as above, so below as within, so without. So when you see a synchronicity, what this means, it's a, it's a sort of overlap between the external world and the internal world. 
uh, when you notice something and someone in, la- in the aisle next to you at the supermarket happens to mention the very thing you are thinking about. Well, that person is an external phenomenon. Um, and we can get into the idea of, you know, we're all one and things like that. But to, to make it simple, right, that is an externalized event and it's synchronized with your internal state, what you're thinking about. Well, the same way as I track memes in, uh, in events, in world events, or someone else is tracking memes in movies, that is very much a reflection of their internal state. And for a lot of the synchronistics, might not write about their personal lives or why this is important to them. But I guarantee you, uh, it definitely is always a reflection of the inner state. Okay, so do you find that archetypes repeat on a collective and personal level? And if so, do they repeat until we understand the message? Is that the purpose of the repetition? Hmm, I think yes and no. Uh, I think it'll keep repeating even after you understand it. So it's not like it's just, you know, sort of smacking over the face until you get it. Because you, even once you're aware of it, you're still going to pick these things up. Uh, I think with all the stuff with synchronicity, what we're hopefully learning is how it applies to our lives or what we can learn from it. Uh, with to say, when you get it, right? Oh, okay, this thing keeps repeating and now I get it. Well, it doesn't stop repeating, but it may be it informs the way that you interact with it, if, if that makes sense. But these archetypes will definitely keep repeating. This is something, uh, let's, let's go here. When we talk about things like Tarot, Kabbalah, uh, you know, different esoteric traditions, alchemy, I think this is something that people get confused by. They're saying, oh, I'm, I'm noticing this in movies or I'm noticing this wherever. I think these, uh, the director of this movie intentionally put this in. Well, okay, perhaps. And there have been very clear cases. The guy uh, whose name is uh, I think Guy Ritchie, who made the movie Revolver, uh, he said he structured this movie based on the Kabbalistic tree of life, that the whole movie is sort of structured that way. Uh, he says that straight out. Um, there's other things where you can see how these things were uh, definitely in there. I did a, a whole write-up about how the movie Groundhog Day was explicitly playing out the trumps of the tarot. And at the time, I was just like, well, this is probably not, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but it seems really pretty spot on. Like, there's no, some of it's just really, really in your face. It's like, I wonder if there's a connection here, if there's something intentional here. Well, someone found an early version of the script uh, for Groundhog Day And in it, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, but the Bill Murray character, the guy who gets stuck in these repeating, in this repeating day, speaking of repeating archetypes, right? He gets stuck in this loop. And uh, one of the early versions of the script had that an ex-girlfriend of his places a curse on him by putting on some object of his with the hanged man trump of the tarot and does some like magic spell. So it was very clear that someone was thinking of those cards when they first started writing that movie, and that it probably impacted whether the, the whole thing was intentional, all their uses of that symbolism were intentional, or if it was at least in there on some subconscious level. And we have cases of intentional use of symbolism. I, I, I always feel the need to stress that it's not, it's not mutually exclusive. However, the reason I talk about Tarot, Kabbalah, these esoteric traditions, is because... I feel like these were older schools that were trying to quantify all of reality or the building blocks of nature. The way that now we study, um, you know, the periodic table of elements. Well, is that really any different than studying Tarot? It's the idea of the universe is made up of these building blocks. And you can rearrange these building blocks in any you know, almost an infinite potential of arrangements, but you're always going to come back to those same building blocks. And what Kabbalah has done, what Tarot has done, is boil it down to a set of building blocks that you can recognize, that you can, you'll see them play out. And then what the, so it's not like they're going to go away or going to stop repeating. 
you know, you're still going to find uh, hydrogen and nitrogen in your in your air, uh, but you're, it's the idea of you can rearrange it, you know, at what point does it become water, at what point does this hydrogen molecule become an atomic bomb, or rather a hydrogen bomb, right? You know, at what point does it become water, at what point is it part of your air? Uh, the same way, you're going to see these archetypes repeating again and again and again and again. Only, I think, the, the, the thing we can do is learn to understand them, learn what they're saying to us or what they might mean in certain arrangements. And that's where you can start to have some understanding. Um, but I don't think they'll ever stop repeating because, at least in my current level of understanding, I feel like they're they're as fundamental to reality as... You know, we're talking like the phi ratio. You can find the phi ratio in human bodies, animal bodies, in most plants that grow. You find the phi ratio in lightning. Um, it's just over and over and over again. This is sort of a way in which nature expresses itself. Uh, so understanding these archetypes, I feel like, is this? it's a very similar study. People just think it has to do with magic or mysticism or esotericism and they sort of write it off or perceive it in this very abstract way but when I mean, we say about what do these archetypes mean or figuring out what they mean I think the reason that so many synchromystics have gotten into the esoteric studies is because we're realizing here's something I thought I figured out you know, you, I study this archetype and I study it and I study it and I study it and I realize, hey, there's some connection between such and such and such and such. Uh, I'll give an example. This is a, a sort of a hard one to, to uh, but it's, it's, I think it's a good example because it sounds so abstract. Talk about these king kills, right? These Saturn cycles and the, the death of, of these leaders and all this sort of stuff. And I kept coming across this connection to what's known as a Catherine wheel. And this is really because I was so fascinated by the Norway spiral when that happened. Um, and it was a, a huge event for me. It was something that I kept trying to wrap my head around and understand. So I kept coming back to this Norway spiral. And at the same time, I keep finding myself attracted to this archetype of this king kill. So here I noticed this connection between a Catherine wheel and, uh, yes, you could do, you could spell it as, there's a number of ways we can break that down, Catherine it's also known as a breaking wheel. It's, it's so called after uh, St. Catherine. She's this um, Christian saint who um, apparently was tied to essentially a wagon wheel. It was an old instrument of torture, and they tried, like, torturing her on it, and then it, like, fell to pieces because she believed in Jesus or something. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny story because she, they try and torture her on this wheel, and the wheel bursts into pieces because she has faith in Jesus, so then they cut her head off, but nothing happens to prevent her head from being cut off. But uh, uh, to me, <laughs> there, there's a reason those, that story plays out that way. If you know my fascination with the king kill as ego death, well, here she ends up on the wheel and loses her head, right? This is you're losing your head and going back into the body where you're just a body. This is something that I kept coming back to and kept coming back to. And it's like, I feel like it's such a strong connection, but it sounded so abstract. How do you say there's a connection between these, this King Kill event and a Catherine wheel? When I, I, I found some uh, medieval book that showed um, the uh, Wheel of Fortune, basically this, this Wheel of Fortune tarot card, we're so used to seeing it with sort of um, this sort of like almost like angel and devil, these two forms of Mercury playing out if we look at the tarot card. But there are medieval versions which they called the Rota Fortunae, the, the Wheel of Fortune. And what they had is four stages of a king placed around this wheel. And at the very top, the king was sitting on a throne. And to the right, he's falling off his throne. At the bottom, he's crawling, that he's, he's lost his throne. And on the left, he's climbing back up it. And there's this these four stages where it says, I reign, um, I reign, I reigned, I've, I've lost my reign, and I will reign again, or something like that. And I found this thing, and it's like, oh, wow, okay, this is, doesn't mean, how do I say this? It's like, it's just a, a form of validation that someone else found this connection that, that 
people have been down the same road before meditating on these symbols and made this connection. And when you find that this happens more and more and you go, okay, here I'm finding some old Kabbalistic book that, you know, I've never even heard of. And they're saying the same things that I was thinking about, these same connections here. Well, it's really, you start saying, hey, uh, this is this is territory that's already been charted. Let me see what else these people say. This is why Carl Jung, you know, there was a t- debate there as to Carl Jung starts getting into alchemy, starts getting to know all this esoteric stuff. And Sigmund Freud is telling him, you're, you're going to ruin us because psychoanalysis has to stay in the realm of science and you keep bringing in all this weird esotericism. Why are you doing that? And Carl Jung had the same experience we, we're having. Well, you're studying synchronicity, how things correlate. Well, that's the basic root of all esoteric traditions, how people have moments of inspiration or how you know something relates to something else, how something's a metaphor, whether it's in the Bible and they're using a, a fable or some sort of parable. Uh, you look in magic. Uh, Alistair Crowley has this, uh, right, this book of correspondences. This equals this. Uh, this is, you know, old magic. This is old esotericism. But we're so used to viewing that through some Harry Potter lens that we're forgetting that this has a very real connection to every moment of every day of our lives. When we're able to recognize these repeating patterns and archetypes, have you noticed, like for you, are you able to better predict plausible events through these repeating archetypes or synchronicities like Fallen Kings? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird territory to get into. Um, I think I, I've mentioned this before. This is, there's debate within the community as to why one would even decide to do such a thing. Uh, and I know I mentioned this uh, last time with you guys, is that there was a point, there's, there's a gentleman named Goro Adachi, uh, one of the old school, sync, we might consider synchro mystics. I don't know if he exactly as- associates himself with that term, but he definitely uses synchronicity. And he, he's uh, one of the authors in the, in the first volume of the Sync book. And his work focuses particularly on predicting future events, showing how if you track patterns and synchronicities, you can see future events. And he does you know, amazing work with this. And then there's this other school of synchro mysticism that says, well, why would you want to do that? And almost like it's almost like it's missing the point that the treasure of synchronicity is finding how everything's interconnected and that it shows us a non-temporal structure to reality, that things don't happen in a linear order. Uh, I should say non-linear, um, not non-temporal, but a non-linear order. And that that's the true secret. So this would be why you can predict future events. The same way that you could go to, like, you know, someone might have a a tarot fortune teller that you can go to, and they might be able to predict the future. You could do, you know, tarot readings to to predict future events. There's a big market for that of, you know, small-time card readers who are trying to, you know, oh, you're going to have success in your love life and things like that. I mean, you can do that. And I don't, I, I, hope, uh, I just want to back up because I don't want to equate Goro Adachi's work with uh, a two-bit fortune teller. But um, this, this is the argument. It's like, yes, you can use these things for that method, but almost, you know, you're missing the higher spiritual truth. This is, this is the argument that gets um, thrown from the, the more, shall we say, like new agey, uh, synchromistic crowd. I had done for a few months on my blog, I experimented with this to see if synchronicity and synchromysticism could predict future events. I wanted to see this for my own, I just needed to answer that question for myself, is could this be done? And uh, this really happened because I kept getting this big indicator on my blog of that there was going to be some nuclear disaster. And uh, it was just kept coming up in everything that I was looking at. Every synchronicity was shouting in my face, nuclear disaster, nuclear disaster. And I was like starting to get a little worried. I don't normally get into this. Like I didn't want to go online and start saying, hey, I think there's going to be. I didn't want to be like one of those 
you know, there's those like YouTube channels that pop up overnight and say there's going to be a giant earthquake or there's going to be a million ke- people killed at the 2012 Olympics. And then, of course, it doesn't happen and they close their YouTube accounts and nothing ever happened, right? So I didn't want to be that that guy just pushing abstract fear into into the, the internet. I'm just like, but I kept coming to this idea of there's some big nuclear disaster that keeps shoving itself in my face. What is What does this mean? What does this mean? And I, I did write about it. This would have, uh, someone wrote here, Fukushima. You're exactly right. This was um, about three months before Fukushima. I wrote about it a lot, uh, about three months before. And then I actually stopped writing about it. The, the, the synchronicities never went away, but I sort of stopped writing about it because of those reasons. I didn't, I, I just didn't know what to really say about it or, or how. I didn't want to just be putting fear out there. And I was like, this is my own, you know, again, it's like, okay, this is an internal event. What is this telling me? And blah, blah, blah. But couldn't shake the sensation. Then, of course, Fukushima happens. And I was like, well, that was that. And I uh, I actually even knew the day because I had been tracking this weird connection between aliens and uh, atomic disaster. And this was through, like, uh, Superman, oh, I don't know, what it, like Superman Quest for Peace. It was like so silly, like some of the things, but it was like these, these the things that I kept being attracted to. Like, why am I watching Superman 4 or something, you know? Um, and all, and then, like, of course, like 2010, the year we make contact, where there's going to be this atomic war, and then they stop, and then, like, you know, the alien intelligence from the monolith stops it. And I was like, I didn't actually believe literal aliens, but I'm like, there's some weird connection between aliens and this atomic destruction. And I, and I wrote about all this stuff. And um, so here we go. Uh, March, I guess that was March um, 3rd or March 11th and uh, when, when Fukushima happened. And that day there was three movies coming out the same day. There was uh, Mars Needs Moms, which is about um, aliens... So, so, I don't know, aliens like adopting kids or something like that. I, I never seen it. Uh, there was another movie called uh, Battle of L.A., which is about an alien invasion uh, in in Los Angeles. The the, the famous uh, I don't know if people are familiar with this idea of there was um, um, there actually was some sort of air fight over Los Angeles years ago. And there was another movie that came out the same day, also about aliens. I don't I don't recall what the third one was, but I was like. That's too many alien-themed movies coming out on the same day. And the other thing was that it was on... Oh, exactly. So it was 3.11. I remembered that it was about 33 because I kept writing about this nuclear connection to the number 33. Now, uh, we very often will use 3.11 as a shorthand or an equivalent number to 33 because 3 times 11 is 33. And this is not just like an, an, you know, a random thing we decided to, to associate with. Um, but you could see that's even used, like um, sometimes Masons will use that. Um, if you, for example, you could use, I think it's the uh, Bank of America logo actually has three 11s. The, the logo is made up of three 11s. Um, regardless, so this date was calling me this, the, I, I saw this was the alien connection, not like, you know, oh, aliens going to come down from outer space, but hey, here's a day where there's going to be three alien theme movies hitting pop consciousness at the exact same time. We get the number 33, and I think there's going to be some sort of nuclear disaster. Well, Fukushima happens, right? So after that, I was kind of shaken, and I thought, how maybe we could actually save people. You know, forget what does predicting future events mean. Maybe there's a chance that we can use this in some sort of scientific way to save people's lives if we could actually find out how to do this. And that's how I really got interested in sync as a forecasting method. So I spent the next uh, few months really delving deep into that aspect of it, trying to use synchronicity and synchromysticism for that purpose. And this culminated with uh, the weekend of the royal wedding uh, in, in Britain. And as you guys will have uh, no doubt realized, the Catherine Wheel, right, well, it was 
who did uh, Prince William marry but but Catherine, right? So uh, I'm seeing all these things coming up at this this royal wedding, and of course, it, you know, a lot of people had different predictions going around, and you know, what did it mean? No, oh, Prince William's the Antichrist, and all these sort of weird weird things that get bandied about. So again, I didn't really want to be one of those guys that's just shouting out random predictions about events, but I couldn't shake how accurate this seemed. So I said, hey, listen, this weekend, the king is going to get shot in the head, and this king is going to resonate with the Antichrist. Now, I, again, uh, just to be clear, I don't believe in an actual, literal Antichrist. Uh, that's not it's not my belief system. It's not for me. Uh, but here I'm thinking Prince William, there's like these uh, people who think Prince William is the Antichrist. And there's other people who think Barack Obama is the Antichrist. So I'm like, okay, maybe these both would represent sort of uh, kingly figures, right? These, this royalty, like the president being the head of a country. This is like a king. This is a symbolic king. And then we have Prince William, who is the future king of, of Britain. And they're both considered by some people to be the Antichrist. I'm like, okay, well, seems like the, this Antichrist resonating king is going to get shot in the head this weekend. Well, I said I didn't know who it was, but that much I knew. So what story do we end up getting? But Osama bin Laden gets shot in the head. He, of course, resonates the Antichrist by being sort of America's public enemy number one and uh, quote-unquote anti-Christian uh, jihad and all this sort of stuff, right? And there's the fact that the name Osama in Japanese means king. Uh, that's that's how you'd say king in Japanese. You say Osama. So it was essentially correct. Um, at least, to, like I said, to my satisfaction, that's pretty damn uh, accurate. Again, I felt like if I really kept studying it, maybe there's a way to make this even more accurate and even more accurate. Uh, as I admit where I didn't know. I didn't know exactly who this was going to be and how it was going to play out, but I knew the time frame and I knew the architecture. And there was, a, again, you know, very much inspired by Koro Adachi. Uh, I felt like there is definitely something to this. And if we really want to devote our time to it, we can continue to do so. So I probably for a few more weeks, I continued to do this, but I, and I started to get a lot of traffic on my blog, but it was people who wanted to know what's the next thing, what's the next thing. And I, I showed a few things, I kept going with it for about another month or so, but it was just, just not, I didn't want that to be, it, it required a sort of focus that I didn't want that to be what I did. I didn't want to just be a researcher who sat there making predictions all the time and trying to figure out future events. I also come at it from the idea that you have to be living to a certain extent in the moment, um, not at the loss of your future, not at the sacrifice of, of you know, future planning, but, but of course, a little bit of living in the now and understanding your moment. And I felt like just looking for the, to the future was, was not the appropriate thing to do. So I didn't. I really didn't want to keep doing that, but I felt like it certainly. I felt very satisfied that such a thing was there. Now it's funny because I haven't really discussed any future events or made any predictions um, in quite a while, just because I don't. I said it was not something I really wanted to do, and uh, but about just about a little over a month ago, I said, hey. Pay attention. Starting on February 13th, I think it was. Um, it was the Tuesday. It's Fat Tuesday. It's uh, basically when Lent starts and they have Mardi Gras. So I think that was February 12th or 13th uh, of this year. And um, I tell you right now, actually, it was February 12th. Okay. Let's look at the calendar here. So I said to pay attention between February 12th and March 3rd. And also, uh, so, and also something having to do with March 17th, but that these, this window was something huge. And I said, it's going to be a sort of echo of that Osama bin Laden royal wedding weekend. Well, of course, what happened? The Pope resigns 
exactly in that window. He he announced it on I think on that day or the or the day after, um, and he uh, said I'm going to resign at the end of February. So that's why it was this sort of window where it wasn't like a date. It was like between February 12th to 13th and March 3rd, he, he announces on the 12th or 13th and actually resigns on the 28th. So it's this weird sort of thing. Um, now, what's important is to give a little context here. The weekend where Osama bin Laden gets shot, uh, and I, I have to put that quote unquote gets shot. I don't, just like I don't believe in an antichrist, I don't believe Osama bin Laden actually died uh, then. Um, it's, you know, uh, I believe it's uh, James Corbett who who did the research in that uh, Osama bin Laden <laughs> was reported dead nine times. Uh, so he, uh, this idea that, you know, hey, yeah, we killed him and we dumped his body at sea and you can't see the body, but trust us, we did it. You know, I don't believe that for a minute. Doesn't matter. It's really sinky. So, uh, right. I, you know, uh, from a from a practical um, level, no, I don't believe Osama bin Laden was really killed then. But regardless, uh, you have to understand this sort of almost. Uh, I actually lean towards this might be an intentional intentional ritual or, or something. You have that weekend. You have in London. You have the royal wedding on Saturday. Barack Obama and says something really interesting. He does his press correspondence dinner. He had just announced his birth certificate, released his birth certificate earlier that week. Uh, and then on Saturday, he does this joking uh, at his press correspondence dinner where he says, I'm, I'm not only going to release my birth certificate, but I'm going to show you a video from my birth. And they play a clip from Disney's Lion King. And then, uh, so this is sort of making this joke but also, he's announcing himself as the Lion King, right? He says, I'm going to show you a video of my birth, and here's the king being born, but specifically the Lion King. On Sunday, then on Sunday, you have the Pope, Pope John Paul II. The Catholic Church beatified him, is what it's called. They basically raise him to sainthood. So they actually dig the Pope's body up out of his grave and do this mass ritual. So Vatican City is filled with all these people praising their dead pope. Uh, so you have London, uh, you have the Vatican, and then uh, Barack Obama announces that he's killed bin Laden, and you have all these people cheering outside the White House again. this So these three major power centers, these, city, these three cities of major power concentration are all doing these huge, you know, masses and masses of people out there praising them for their, you know, nonsense. But there's a specific alchemical narrative here that you have to realize. There's what's known as the Rosary of the Philosophers. Um, you, can, you can Google this. Uh, it's, it's worth looking into. There's a, a, just a small number of, of steps in this specific alchemical sequence. And basically what happens is the king and queen meet, you have the alchemical marriage, and they do this in a, they go into the alchemical bath. The king and queen are united, they, they are naked and united in the bath, and then they die. And then they raise up to a heavenly plane, and then their heavenly spirit comes back into their bodies, and they are reborn. Well, now think about this. You have, on Friday, you have the royal wedding. That's your alchemical marriage. On Saturday, uh, you have uh, Barack Obama announcing himself as the Lion King, right? And he's and he, he already announcing his birth certificate. By reintroducing his birth certificate, he's essentially showing, I am reborn. I'm reintroducing my birth certificate. Then on Sunday, you have the Pope being beatified, raised to, to a saintly or heavenly status, dug up from the grave to be raised to a heavenly status. This, again, ties in with our chemical sequence, where the dead king, his spirit rises up into heaven. Uh, and then, immediately followed by the death of Osama bin Laden, and to me, you have to understand what this means. Osama, as I told you in Japanese, means king, but in Arabic, it means lion. So Barack Obama, by announcing himself as the Lion King, and then 
announcing, I've killed the Lion King. He's essentially taking on that role. He's saying, I've killed the Lion King. I am the Lion King. So here we have this full sequence playing out of death of the king, the alchemical marriage, death of the king, raising up to heaven, all this sort of stuff, right? So, uh, oh, and also in there, uh, this is, gets a little more complicated, but just, just uh, I'll have to quickly say there was an event at CERN that weekend as well, which I, I wrote all about. If anyone's interested, go to allthehappycreatures.blogspot.com. Do a keyword search for Pope, P-O-P-E, and you should be able to find the different places that I've written about this if you think I'm – because I'm trying to just kind of throw this all out there quickly. So we have also an event at CERN. And one of the things I was able to do is show how all these things tied together and blah, blah, blah. So exactly about a month ago, exactly about, does that even make sense? About a month ago, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I say, hey, listen, check out this window and you're going to see this. I, it's it's, it's going to be a huge story and it's going to be an echo of this weekend that basically my Suicide Kings book is all based out of that weekend. Like once I, it all clicked into place and I was like, Essentially, like, holy shit, what people don't even realize what happened. It just it just turned into a debate of, you know, um, whether or not Osama bin Laden was really killed. You have this sort of, you know, oh, it's the conspiracy crowd doesn't believe he really died. And then the, you know, good old boy Americans who are, you know, clapping hands. Yay, we killed someone. You know, yay, we're, 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 we're murderers, uh, too. So, so the, 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 to me, the... the this narrative got so overshadowed by the debate that people didn't really even process what this meant or, or blah, blah, blah. So a month ago, I say some huge thing's going to happen, and it's going to repeat something from that weekend. Now, here again, I thought possibly um, Barack Obama's life is in danger because this guy, I mean, this guy aside from being, you know, a douchebag as a politician and being a homicidal maniac as far as his foreign policy goes, I have no no love or respect for the man, but I definitely don't want to see any harm come to him because I think that'll make political debate even more difficult than it already is. Uh, I'm going to put that out there because that's sort of an ongoing fear I have, um, is it will definitely make, if anything were to happen, it would make an already difficult situation a lot harder so I really hope nothing happens to him, but he's playing he's playing Russian roulette essentially. This guy is playing out an alchemical role and really playing it up. You know, and I made the joke, it's it's a sort of morbid joke, but you know, the way someone might uh commit suicide by cop. Are you familiar with the expression suicide by cop? Yes. Uh I feel like Obama's playing suicide by archetype. He's sort of egging this on, which is uh, interesting in another level. But even at his, at, his, so he, at his second inauguration, what does the dude do? He, he, he doesn't just swear on one Bible. He swears on two Bibles, right? right. Well, whose, Bi- whose Bibles does he choose? You know, uh, Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln. You know, do the math, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like he's really playing, playing this up big time, this martyr role. Uh, Anyway, so we have directly, here we are a month after he's playing with these two, he's playing Russian roulette with these Bibles and all this sort of stuff. And okay, I'm thinking something big, something big. And it's, I said, it's really, really unprecedented. And it's going to be a repeat of this weekend. So here, what do we actually have happen? You have the Pope resigns. So here we had in in the first version, we have the Pope being beatified. And we have now the Pope actually resigning and, and in some cases being damned, right? You know, oh, how could he do such a thing? Then we have, a few days later, we have President of Venezuela. Um, oh, yeah. Chavez, right? Yes, thank you. Hugo Chavez dies. Okay. So here, here's another you know, sort of axis of evil member going down at the same time. So just like we lost, uh, just like we lost Bin Laden... Now we've lost Hugo Chavez, you know, one of the uh, America's sort of terrorist nations or acts of evil and all this sort of stuff. So we have uh, Chavez goes down. Uh, we have uh, the Pope resigning. 
And then we have March 14th, CERN announces they found the Higgs boson. So I think that's pretty damn specific uh, time period of all these things playing out over the course of this, this uh, how this plays out. And then you have, um, there's other things, like I talk about the Catherine Wheel. Do you know the day the Pope resigned, the Google Doodle, it's a silly phrase, but the Google Doodle for that day, which that means that all those millions and millions of people who log on to Google a day, I, I actually want to figure that out, is how many people log on to Google a day, because what impact this must have on the collective unconscious, right? How many people right. are getting bombarded by that Google Doodle every day. Well, the day the Pope dies, what is the Google Doodle? It is the Ferris wheel. It says the anniversary of the man who invented the Ferris wheel. This is the Catherine wheel. Ferris wheel is also known as a Catherine wheel. So Google is putting Ferris wheel as the, the big thing, and here's the Pope resigning. And then we've talked, uh, I don't recall exactly how much detail I gave about the the 77s that are inherent in the JFK assassination, the king kill there. Um, people might realize that the 77 is also in 9-11. Like this is really sort of a very th- strong through line. You either have a 77 or a 777 or the number 93. And that sounds like I'm just pulling things out of a hat. Uh, if you Google... While you're looking at your Ferris wheel, Google um, 777 lightning flash of creation. Uh, It might be a little lot to explain here. Basically, on the Kabbalistic tree of life, there are 22 paths. Um, There are 22 Hebrew letters, and there are 22 trumps of the tarot. This is not an accident. This is a century. Again, we're talking about the, the, the fundamental building blocks. There are 22 of these basic units, let's call them. Uh, so there's either 22 Hebrew letters, 22 trumps the tarot, and 22 paths on the Kabbalistic tree of life. So there are placements that you would attribute on those paths. You would attribute either a Hebrew letter or a tarot card. You can do it either way. And there's what's known as the the lightning flash of creation, which is a very specific pattern that you would trace out on this tree of life. And it either, if you're using the Hebrew letters, uh, if people are familiar with Hebrew, there are no numerical characters in Hebrew. So you use a letter is also has a numerical value. Well, it's almost like Roman numerals, but not exactly. Each, each letter has a number uh, equivalent. So if you total up this lightning flash on the tree in Hebrew letters, it totals 777. And if you use the trumps of the tarot and you trace out this pattern, it comes up to 93. This is why uh, Thelemites, uh, followers of Aleister Crowley, will use the number 93 as, you, you'll see this all over Thelema. So um, 93 is really huge. Aleister Crowley wrote a book called 777. That's actually his book of correspondences. So there's, these are not just abstractions. Um, there's, there is a tradition behind this. Uh, regardless, if you look at any of these king kills, you're going to see either this 77 or 777 or 93. With 9-11, it was ridiculously explicit, right? We have Flight 93 uh, goes down. We have Flight 77 that hits the Pentagon. And then the two planes that hit the World Trade Center, one of them hits at the 77th floor, the other one hits at the 93rd floor. And those two plane numbers total up to be, uh, I believe, 93 each. It's just crazy. It's like it's so numerically perfect that it's, this is why we very often end up wondering if this is a uh, high-scale ritual, right? This is my, most of the conspiracy crowd would say this is elaborate ritual done by some sort of um, elite sorcerers and things like that. There are times where I have to question myself, it gets sometimes if it's so freaking exact that gets really hard to to argue with that point. But just to say, so I'm making this point and I'm saying, hey, you got your Catherine wheel, you're gonna have your your ninety three, you're gonna have all these things. Well, the Pope, the Pope resigns, what happens? The Vatican gets struck by a lightning bolt, right? Right. So here's, yeah. your, here's, here's your lightning flash to accompany the king kill. 
and he actually resigns at 7 7 uh, Vatican time, seven, at 7 p.m. and 7 minutes. So it's like just ridiculous. Um, and I found myself when this, this event happened, just wishing that I had finished this book already because I hear, you know, people were debating all these different things and I just want to be like, no, I'll tell you what it means. I just let me finish this book. It's, it happened too fast. <laughs> but uh, I hope it's a very long way of answering your questions to say, like, yeah, sync can definitely be used to predict future events or to show how events are going to play out. While I think there is a, an occasionally a value to it, I think the biggest value I see in it is I love – it just gives me a kick to show people that time isn't linear. You know, that's – I don't want to come out here and be like, hey, I'm psychic or, hey, I can predict the future for any reason than to say, listen, reality is not as linear as we think it is and hopefully this is some sort of evidence of that. that that's the kick I get out of it. But ultimately what I think uh, the true value of any of this stuff is understanding how these archetypes play out so you can – you know how to react to it. When there is a 9-11, everyone's freaking out. Oh, my God, you know, we're under attack or, oh, it's a conspiracy. or You know, there's the, – it goes right into a political debate. And if you can understand sort of how these events occur, what patterns to look out for, and also what sort of – what the implication is. Like, for example, with this pope resigning being immediately followed by the uh, CERN announcing they found the Higgs boson, which is, quote unquote, the God particle, right? So here you have the head of the Catholic Church stepping down and then the Church of Science stepping up and saying, this man has lost his faith in God. He's not even withholding his his uh, vow anymore to be pope. But don't worry, we've got God now. And what you always see is the death of the king and the birth of a king. And unfortunately, for anyone who wants to be a free and sovereign person in this world, that's, you know, this, that power vacuum gets filled mighty quickly. But if we learn how these archetypes repeat, then hopefully we can learn a lesson and not get caught up in it. And my lesson, I think, for this would be, hell, I'd love to see the Catholic Church burn, but we don't want to see it supplanted with the Church of Science. You know, we don't want to fall into the spell of another dogma. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. You know, you had mentioned earlier about forecasting and seeing these patterns and the way that your mind works just for me talking to you. When you do see these patterns and you're trying to live in the now and not forecast, is that do you feel pulled into that, like necessary to say something just to track the patterns or your own successes? And I'm curious if... Of late, if you've seen anything, like uh, there's some talk in alternative blogs about a global coastal event or lots of water or meteor type things. Are you seeing anything like that? Oh, you know, uh, the meteor thing is is huge, right? Now, I was writing about this stuff. uh, One of the last, I I haven't, I barely touched my blog in the last few months, but one of the last blog posts I did was pointing out how we should be paying attention to this meteor sink. Uh, and I was telling the NASA did this thing where at the end of 2012, they crash landed what's known as Grail. You know, NASA loves to play with intentional symbolism. So uh, they crash Grail into the moon, and it's these twin probes. Then we have at the same time, like we have these all these uh, shootings happening with these these kids shooting all these other kids. It's really sad, but it's. Uh, I was drawing the connection between these things, particularly like, uh, if you guys remember, Gabriel Giffords, the congressman who got shot. Oh, yes. yes. Jared Lee Loner, uh, the guy who supposedly shot her. Uh, again, I, I love that his name is Loner, right? It's like the lone gunman. It's, sometimes uh-huh. this is, this stuff is like, it's just silly. I, yeah, at some point you have to laugh. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, I agree. At some point you just have to laugh. <laughs> but um, he... Uh, he had this YouTube channel, right? And one of the conspiracy nodes that I think is, is really fascinating is that he only had like two people subscribed to his YouTube channel, one of which was Gabriel Giffords, which is pretty crazy if you had seen what he had on his YouTube channel. I actually think his YouTube channel might still be online. I encourage people to look up 
Jared Wee Woner's YouTube channel just for, uh, it's just an interesting little study. But he had actually had two YouTube channels. And on one of them, he does this really abstract video, which is just him like walking slowly up to a an American flag and burning it and walking away. And it's this, it's this sort of really interesting little piece of abstract film. And it has underneath it the, the, the video description. He writes all this, all this uh, what would seem like schizophrenic gibberish. But one of the things he does is he says, I want you to imagine an asteroid or a meteor coming through the atmosphere. And when the event happened, like the literally the day of the Gabriel Gifford shooting, I had done a really long blog post talking about all these things that were upcoming and how they were playing out and different stuff. One of the things I was really, I kept talking about was this meteor sink, uh, meteors, asteroids, things like that. And I was like, just was like kind of beating me over the head again. And I was like, what is the deal with this? And then that, as I, I published the blog post, and within 20 minutes, this Gifford story broke. And as soon as I saw this kid with this lines of gibberish, and he just says, I want you to imagine an asteroid or a meteor coming through the atmosphere. And I was like, I sort of zeroed in on that because of all the other things I had been tracking. And that line... That, that Woner wrote has sort of stuck with me. Now, we had the Sandy Hook shooting, and Warren Coleman was connecting it to meteors, and we have this idea of, um, when I say like the, the NASA's grail probes, when they let them crash into the moon, this is the same thing. It's a, it's a falling satellite, right? Is the same thing as we might expect, like a falling meteor. We're dropping things on the moon, that, that we're circling the moon, and then we just sort of let it fall out of, out of orbit and crash. So I was making this connection, all these different things, and then we have another shooting, which reminded me of uh, what Jared Lee Loner said and all this sort of stuff. And I was just saying, keep an eye out for that. Well, let's rewind a, m- a month or so. I mean, what directly preceded the Pope's resignation were those hu- two huge meteor stories, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, I mean, I don't, you know, is that, is there more, more stuff like that coming? I mean, again, these things definitely repeat. But it's, I, I don't, I don't have any like particular um, prediction for, for this sort of stuff. Like that was the, the the feeling in my gut of something big was for a month ago. But bear in mind, like these are the things that I'm paying attention to. I'm writing a book all about this King Kill cycle, so that's what I'm really, you know, sort of clued into at the moment, and that's probably why I really felt it coming on strong. I mean. You know, we live in an age where I would like to think most of us don't really care what the Pope does, you know, whether he resigns or, or what he does. But on a personal political level, I mean, I, don't, I really don't care. I, he has no power over me and, I, I'm, you know, I don't really care what he does. Uh, at the same time, from a historical perspective, it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, you know, first time in 700 years, it, what, what the, the implications the historical precedents are are pretty astounding. Yeah, I think I think so too. It's interesting to observe, even though he doesn't have any power over me. I I don't give him much thought other than the collective observation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I know. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah you did, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, Alan. Tell us about other events in which you were involved and where one can purchase your books. Oh, thank you. My website is syncbookpress.com, or you can go to thesyncbook.com. I should point out that sync, we're spelling S-Y-N-C. It's just S-Y-N-C, so we can do syncbookpress.com or thesyncbook.com. My own website is allthehappycreatures.com. This completes part one of three of our continuing conversation with Alan Green. 